I'm Brute Wolf. Uh, Mitch and I, I'll be bringing the sermon this morning. Mitch and I have set up mutual fantasy camps for each other, and next month he'll be performing eye surgery downtown. I did not want to get out of this chair. It's, I feel like I'm in a Mathis Brothers commercial up here. This is, this is great. All four of my kids are at the Houston mission trip right now, and they claim that they're going to be watching this uh, on live stream, which I guess during their worship service. So as a tribute to that, if I see any of you using your cell phone right now, I'm not going to call you out. I'm just going to assume that you're listening to a sermon from a family member. Uh, Jennifer and I have been managing the uh, young families Bible class now for the past uh, several years. And before we were uh, asked to do it, I had never led a Bible class before. So just to give uh, a shout out to adult education, I really want to encourage some of you to be involved with that. It's just not that hard. It is as easy as teaching the kids and the, the youth, the young kids and the youth. You know that thing you do with children where you ask them a Bible question and if they get it right, you throw them a piece of candy? It's the same thing with adults, but instead of candy, you throw credit card points. Yes, Obadiah, 100 points on your visa. And it works. Children love their candy. Adults love their credit card points. You know, the, fir the first uh, time that we had actually, uh, I guess I may want to use that. Yeah. The first time that we had actually w went into that class, there was uh, one of the young couples wanted to uh, have everybody over for their house. This has been a few years now. It's probably five, four or five years ago now. Uh, and so we go over to their house, and all of the men start to congregate in the backyard. And I'm standing there in the backyard. These guys are all in their 20s and 30s. And I look around, and I realize that I am the only guy with his shirt tucked in. <laughs> and I'm like, why didn't I get this email? So now I'm panicked. I'm trying to bend over to look at it and say, hey, that's a mighty nice grill you got there. And I start pulling my shirt uh, out of my pants. But it was a revelation to me that I could do that. And now my ministry is to come back and talk to the 50-something 50, 50 guys and try to update them on what the rules are. And we need to review. Guys, shirt and shorts, untuck. Shirt and pants while you're giving a, a Sunday morning sermon, tuck. Men over 60 still wearing socks and sandals, it's too late. Move on with life, we've given up on you. The, uh, so that was nice. I liked it when they told me I could untuck my shirt. I was okay with the idea of giving up my fanny pack. But guys, get your hands off my cargo pants. The men in their 20s are trying to tell us that cargo pants are going out of style. And these are the ones who are about to be young dads, and they have no idea how useful cargo pants are. You can stuff that stuff with Capri Suns and go and cereal bars with room left over you know, for a diaper down here and some wipes over here. Ryan, didn't Ryan do a great job with the reading? Ryan read to us the story about the hungry multitude. If those 5,000 men had had cargo pants, they could have waddled into the service and said, Jesus, don't worry, I got you covered. Slim Jims for everybody. And they could have pulled it out. And that still would have been a great Bible story. But as it, as it turns out, I think we've got an even better one, where Jesus produces probably a trailer truck, maybe two trailer trucks full of uh, food to feed uh, this large company. And it worked. And as Matthew, Mark, and Luke record it, it's one of the happiest stories in Jesus' ministry. But then you get to the book of John, and John likes to mess things up. John gives us, he gives us the director's cut. There's a couple of, a little bit of bonus material. Two things that he has that are nowhere else. Number one, the boy with bread and fish, our one-hit wonder. It's the only time he's mentioned in the Bible. But the other thing that he tells us is that this story doesn't have the happy ending that we usually tell in the children's Bible hour, because these people... 5,000 men, so maybe 10 or 15,000 people, all there watching Jesus as he healed them, gave them good news, and uh, fed them miraculously. God in flesh was doing this for them, and they didn't see it. What they saw was a candidate. They saw a politician. They saw maybe their future military general. Or maybe, and then they started banding together and said, Let's go get him. Let's recruit him. He's going to be our king. 
And Jesus realized that this was about to happen, so he sneaked away. And that's how the story ends. It must have broken Jesus' heart. But this crowd was not acting with their heart. This crowd was acting under the influence of the crowd. Now, I like crowds, especially crowds like this where I get to talk and you don't, and for a few minutes I can pretend that I'm an extrovert. Because I'm really not. You know the meet and greet that we do at the beginning of service? You know, hey, everybody, get up and hug a hand and shake a neck. I can get through it okay, and I'm fine with it. But here's a real truth. There are probably, in a crowd this size, at least 100 and maybe 200 of you who dread that, who dread the idea when everybody gets up and you're being told without any organization, without any advice, now I'm supposed to go talk to people. You probably wish we had, like in the Babylon Bee, special introvert service at 1130. No one gets to talk to anyone. And that would be right up your alley. <clears throat> you know what? That's okay. But we don't have that for you. So I will challenge you to do this. Next time we do the gripping and grinning, and you're just not feeling it, do this for me. Use your superpower. Draw into yourself. See the things that other people don't see, that you already know that you're good at, because the rest of us are too busy talking. Look for God and his spirit moving in this room, and then on your timetable, come back and tell us about it. Don't melt away. Bring Jesus to us. We need you. That was not an introvert saying amen. <clears throat> I was afraid that might happen. I would have gotten a double head nod if it was an actual introvert. <laughs> June 11, 2002. Anybody know what that was? Anybody born June 11, 2002? One of the greatest days in the history of Tulsa. June 11, 2002, Krispy Kreme Donuts opened on 71st Street. <laughs> I remember that day. I did not get in the line, but I drove by it a couple times to see how long it was. The line of cars literally stretched from Krispy Kreme near 169 all the way down 71st Street to Mingo, where it curved to the south around Zio's, and at the end it, and I kid you not, it blocked the entrance to the Daylight Donuts. <laughs> Poor guy couldn't catch a break. But I already knew about Krispy Kreme because a couple of years earlier, we had gone to some friends of ours who lived uh, in somewhere in Metro Dallas. You know, if you, ever, you notice, nobody lives in Dallas. Everybody lives in Dallas, well, actually. Dallas, well, actually, Irving. Dallas, well, actually, Carrollton. So we were in Dallas, well, actually, suburb A. And they're talking to us that night. And he says, have you guys ever heard of Krispy Kreme? And I'm like, no, what is it? And he, he was like, oh, oh, oh we got to go tomorrow. So the next morning, we get in the car, and we drive 20 miles to the nearest Krispy Kreme at that time. And he had been describing it to me uh, before we got in. And I went, by the time I made it to the doors, there should have been angels holding trumpets as we walked through. I opened up and walked in, and I see yet another window as we get to peer into the Holy of Holies and this conveyor belt of love with little glistening circles floating across phonetically spelling out my verbal reaction to this. Oh, <laughs> we kept on going through the line. We come around the corner to meet the high priest in a paper cap. He hands me the donut and he says, no charge, sir. I take a bite and I knew right then that my salvation was assured because this was heaven. <laughs> we bought a couple of dozen of these and get back in the car and head back to Dallas, well, actually, suburb A. And as we're driving, I'm looking at these boxes, and I'm thinking, I've seen this before. You know, the red font, the green trim, and then it hits me. I've had these before. These were the donuts that they put in the surgery lounge every day in Birmingham, Alabama, for three years that I was training there. But nobody ever made a big deal out of it. Because in Alabama, they don't call them Krispy Kreme donuts. They call them donuts. I had been eating the greatest treat in the history of saturated fats, and I didn't even know it. 
because I had not slowed down. I was trying so hard to speed through that something that great, I missed out. I just didn't take time to stop and taste the donuts. That needs to be the new cliche. This big crowd that had gathered for Jesus, it was doomed from the start. It reads like it may not have even been Jesus' idea, but the people were forcing the issue. And what they were doing, we're going to put the Sea of Galilee out this way, okay? So the Sea of Galilee is out there, and these people are starting to monitor Jesus' boat because they know he's on that boat. So now they're trying to figure out, where is he going to make sure? And as soon as he makes sure, all the people from all the city, they were running. They were never going to appreciate Jesus because they were in too much of a hurry. So all of them are running to get to Jesus, including our boy, a boy who almost certainly had a mom. And I can just imagine him trying to get out that morning to run through the door to catch up with his friends, and his mom says, hey, mister, stop. Come back here. And he says, but mom, my friends are running. I'm going to miss it. And I think his mom would have said, no, you're not going to miss it. I don't know who this Jesus is, but I know he's a preacher, so he's probably going to go long. Here is some bread and fish. Take this. Now go catch up with your friends. And then they gathered. 10, 15,000 people. We've got, what, maybe 1,000 people in here this morning. Copy and paste this crowd and put another one right behind us. And then do that again and again until we have about a, a dozen park auditoriums full of people. All the way from here to Garnett and you get an idea of about the size of what they were dealing with. But as the hours wear on, the people are starting to get a little restless. And yes, they're starting to get, a hun get hungry, but now you're also realizing that you've got to walk all the way back to Owasso before it gets dark. And now people are starting to get a little bit worried. Bring up my first picture. It's possible that this is what this place looked like. This is a grassy field. We know it was a grassy field somewhere near the Sea of Galilee. You've got the Sea of Galilee off in the distance. Okay? We do know that Jesus preached to these people. We don't know what he said. But as you look at that picture, there have been some people to make a guess of what one of Jesus' sermons maybe these people could use. Look at the grass. The grass isn't worried. God takes care of the grass. So much he'll put lilies in the field with the grass. So why are you worried about food? Okay, so we got the Sea of Galilee this way. That makes this way west, all right? About four or five months earlier, probably four or five months earlier, and probably about six or seven miles this way, Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, when all the ink in your Bible turns red. Now, I can't say that our boy with the bread and fish was at the Sermon on the Mount. And I certainly can't say that Jesus used any of this material for this crowd. But I can say that our boy was already living that sermon. I don't have a movie clip for you. The reason I don't have a movie clip for you is because it hasn't been produced yet. So we're going to do that this morning without cameras. We're going to use the power of imagination. We're going to go over here to the Sermon on the Mount. And at the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> we're going to take our little splicer, little iMovie 09, and we're going to splice out some audio clips. Okay? We've got them. Some audio clips of Jesus' sermon. We've got five audio clips. And now we're going to bring them back over for our video. And the video is going to be the boy with his bread and fish, okay? And we're going to lay over on top of it. We're going to dub in Jesus' words. You with me so far? Okay. So it goes something like this. The boy is sitting on the grass and probably has been hiding his food because he's concerned there might be some people taking it. But we get to hear the words of Jesus. Why do you worry? And the boy uncovers his food. And then we hear Jesus say for the first of three times, 
do not worry. And the boy gets up off the grass. Do not worry. And he starts to make his way through the crowd. Do not worry. And then the boy spots him right there and starts heading toward him as we hear Jesus say, how can you add a single hour to your life by worrying? And the boy thinks, there he is. There's Andrew. And he takes his food and he says, Mr. Andrew, same words that the mom used, take this. Do not worry. Do not worry. Do not worry. Some of the sweetest words that Jesus ever said, but also some of the most abused. Don't worry. But you know who we usually abuse with the phrase, do not worry? Who I see it the most? We abuse ourselves. I know I shouldn't worry. I know it's not right to worry. Lord, there's an armed intruder in my house, and I know you want me to just chillax. I'll do the best I can. But Jesus didn't say, don't worry, just calm down. Don't you just love it when somebody tells you to calm down? Go to this next picture. This is my favorite road sign of all time. Never in the history of calm down has anyone calmed down by being told to calm down. <laughs> Jesus did not say to calm down. Jesus gives his answer to worrying in this sermon over here. Sandwiched in between do not worry and do not worry comes Matthew 6.33 right in the middle. Seek. Seek first the kingdom of God. The opposite of worrying is not calming down. The opposite of worrying is seeking. Do you realize how easy it is to seek? This may be one of the easiest commandments that God ever gave us. He did not say, overcome your worry. He did not say, Figure out all the answers. He said, no, look for them. Because the opposite of worrying is seeking. No matter how dark it may seem, Jesus is not telling you to calm down. He's not telling you to cheer up. He is just trying to tell you, I am here. Look for me. Seek me. Because the opposite of worrying is seeking. It's a beautiful song, isn't it? Seek ye first. Let's sing that together, if you would, okay? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We'll let the sopranos show off some other time. But as I go through this song now for decades, the song is starting to perplex me just a little bit because the next verse kind of makes sense. Ask and it shall be given. That's Sermon on the Mount too. But then it's, I am the door. The, you know, and then it's, so suddenly we're jumping over to John. Okay. Then it's, uh, what is it about? Man shall not live by bread. So we've suddenly jumped over to the temptation. So this song is almost a repository for any Bible verse that you happen to like. In the beginning, God created. Okay, now First Chronicles. Behold the list of the kings of Edom. But if you're going to call a song, seek ye first. The second most important verse was not put in. Because our motivation to seek is so that we don't have to worry. And so with your indulgence, I have created a new verse to this song. Do not worry, do not worry. Don't worry, 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 don't worry. I cannot overstate this. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And that's as far as I got. So, but... To celebrate the fact that it's the first time I've ever tried to write a verse to a hymn, on your bulletin this morning, on the back, the, my lyrics are the fill in the blank. Don't worry, 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 don't worry. Because the opposite of worrying is seeking. When our kids were little, and we're talking really little, this is before Zoe was even born, so we had three tiny kids. We went to the San Diego Zoo. 
And Jennifer and I were ready for this. We knew all the ins and outs. The big feature of the San Diego Zoo, at least at that time, was the open-air double-decker bus. And we knew that, number one, you want to do it in the afternoon because the kids might be tired. It's good to have them on a bus. Number two, right when we walked on, we knew to go straight to the top because we wanted the big, expansive views on that open-air top, okay, on this gorgeous, beautiful, sunny San Diego afternoon. So off we go for a 45-minute tour. Five minutes into the tour, it starts off with just a few raindrops. Silly raindrops, as I call them to the kids. Silly, by the way, is synonymous in dad speak for do not worry, as in silly car crash, mom doesn't need to know. <laughs> silly raindrops, but then those silly raindrops, all of a sudden, it literally just came gushing down like an Oklahoma thunderstorm. And instantly, on the PA system on the bus, they say, for your protection, you are not allowed to come down below to take cover. So we are stuck up here. We are locked up here, and we are getting drenched. The animals have taken cover, and they're pointing back at us. <laughs> we are locked in a floating cage in the greatest zoo in the world, Pa-Lee's. But what happened next was almost like a beautiful dance. Jennifer took the backpack and opened it up, and I reached in with one hand and pulled up not one, but two umbrellas. Jennifer pulled the Velcro strap. I pushed the button, extended the umbrella, pulled it back down. She huddled in the kids. I took my jacket, stretched it around to make sure all, all the rain coming in sideways was stopped. And we're all right. We're all right. We're a little wet, but we're all right. And then I hear a sound, inaudible, to all human ears, except mine. Beep, 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 beep. It's my wife's good Samaritan radar. She's decided to start looking around all over the bus to find out who might need our help. There's somebody here who might be in danger. Beep, 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 beep. And as always, she locks in on target. Beep, 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 in the back row, I turn around to look, and 35 rows behind us, at least that's how I remember it, 35 rows behind us was a woman in a jacket with a baby, trying to get her baby into the jacket with some success. And Jennifer said, we've got a spare umbrella. Give her the umbrella. And I said, I'm just trying to keep my family dry right now. And she said, she needs the umbrella. And I said, she's 45 rows behind us. And she's got a jacket. And Jennifer said, give her the umbrella. And I said, no. We're too settled. <laughs> and Jennifer looked back at me and said, Give her the umbrella! <laughs> at least that's how I remember it. So off I go, 55 rows to the back of the bus. <laughs> and it's a good thing it was that long because it gave me time to convert from angry brute to nice brute. And I walked up to the woman and I said, take this. There are, if you look at some of the research, supposedly, six primary facial expressions which are burned into human DNA. All other facial expressions are a combination of those six or a suppression of one that you don't want somebody to see. They are disgust. Disgust, all you need is the upper lip. There's sadness, where the inside of the eyebrows go up. Anger, where the eyebrows go down. Fear, 
where the eyelids come up. Surprise, where the eyelids and the eyebrows go up. And then there's joy. And joy requires the entire face. Now what they will tell you is that across all cultures and all places, the facial expression that is the most pleasing to look at, that we most want to see on someone else, is the combination of joy and surprise. It is very rare in its pure form. And you don't get to see it long because it hits the face and it's off like a shooting star. Sometimes you can see it on a child when he opens up a, Christ a perfect Christmas present. You might see it on a soldier's mom when her son decides to surprise her by coming home without letting her know. Take this. <gasps> Thank you. And I'm not sure because we were wet, but I think she started to tear up. So I got to see it. The combination of joy and surprise on a bus in San Diego in the middle of a rainstorm. So I walk back to my seat, nine rows, <laughs> sat down where Jennifer met me with a combination of joy and disgust. which in American culture is known as a smirk. <laughs> Go back and look at this story again and ask yourself, who is worrying and who is seeking? They've got us in a floating cage, greatest zoo in the world, please. We're all right. We're all right. We're a little wet, but we're all right now. Who needs our help? But I had a good reason. I wasn't worried about me. I was worried about my kids. Does anybody buy that? <laughs> the reason I still remember the story for this long is because I've dealt with the fact that had it been left to me, that woman would have gotten soaked. It can rain hard. And if you feel like you're stuck on a bus and there's nobody there, please, if nothing else, believe me when I tell you, there are hundreds of spare umbrellas in this room. And for the rest of you, when you're willing to pull that umbrella out, open it up, and give it away, then you've finally gotten on the road to stop worrying and start seeking. For some of you, your seeking may have led you here this morning, and if we can help you out in your search in some way, please come down while we stand and while we sing. Thank you.